The United States is endowed with many extraordinary natural areas. Congress has taken steps to preserve and protect many of these locations as national parks and wilderness areas, with the goal of leaving them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. We visit these areas to enjoy the wilderness, the clean air, and breathtaking vistas. But often these vistas are degraded by air pollution, which causes regional haze. The Clean Air Act established a national goal to remedy existing visibility impairment and prevent future impairment in many of these national parks and wilderness areas. And EPA has developed a regional haze air quality program by which state governments can work together to make progress toward this goal. The purpose of this video is to help you understand how air pollution causes visibility problems and how the Regional Haze Program can help address these problems. Section 1 explores some basic visibility concepts, beginning with a definition of visibility impairment and a description of how pollutants interact with light to cause impairment. We will identify visibility reducing pollutants and look at where they come from define visibility indexes, and discuss how visibility is measured. We will examine monitoring data to compare haze in different parts of the country. In Section 2 of the video, we look at tools for managing regional haze, outlining ways to estimate emissions, and identify some causes of haze. We will discuss how we can reduce regional haze with an emphasis on the clean air laws and federal and state regulations, including the new regional haze rule. We will identify visibility programs and the roles and responsibilities of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, federal land managers, and state, local, and tribal air pollution control agencies. Finally, we will talk about health effects and discuss actions concerned citizens can take to reduce air pollution at home, suggesting ways to become actively involved in the community decisions and be part of the regulatory process. Our current lifestyles mean we travel in automobiles, consume electricity, and use manufactured products. All of these activities cause air pollution. Although much has been done over the last 30 years to make these activities less polluting, the nation's population continues to grow, and considerable amounts of air pollution are still emitted into the atmosphere. The most obvious indicator of pollution in the air is how well we can see through it. Visibility impacts are seen not just in urban areas, but across broad regions of the country, in rural and even in remote areas. This is because pollutants causing visibility impairment can travel hundreds of miles downwind, often across political boundaries. Thus, visibility impairment is a regional problem, and virtually all our national park units and wilderness areas experience some degree of human-caused haze. Visibility impairment is generally associated with discoloration, haziness, and loss of detail in scenic features. How impairment manifests itself depends on the extent and distribution of small particles suspended in the atmosphere. Generally, visibility impairment can be categorized into three types, layered haze, plume, and uniform haze. When the air is stable, pollution can be trapped near the ground by the colder air above it. You can often see the top of the pollution layer. We call this type of impairment a layered haze. This is the Gila wilderness on a clear day. The dark boundary of a layered haze is clearly defined in this photograph. Localized sources emitting a stream of pollution very high into a stable atmosphere can create a type of impairment we call an elevated layer or plume. Pollution is transported in some direction with little or no mixing with the atmosphere, remaining in a constrained, tight layer. A thin dark plume can be seen in this time-lapse video from Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge. 
The plume is a result of a paper mill emitting pollution into a very stable atmosphere. The third type of impairment, the uniform haze, is present when pollutants seem to uniformly degrade the view from the ground to a height well above the highest landscape feature. This is the Hoover Wilderness in California on a clear day. Note the loss of contrast and detail when it is affected by a uniform haze. This view of the Gila Wilderness in New Mexico disappears behind this uniform haze. A uniform haze that moves through the atmosphere to cover a large geographic area is called a regional haze. If you notice bad visibility during a visit to a park or wilderness area, this is most likely due to regional haze. Regional hazes cause most of the visibility problems. In order to understand regional haze, we must understand the effects that various pollutants have on the appearance of a scene. This hiker sees the landscape feature as light is reflected to form an image. However, particles and gases suspended in the view path can scatter or redirect image forming light as it travels to the eye. Through this scattering process, some image forming light is removed from the sight path. In addition, sunlight or reflected light can be scattered into the sight path, interfering with the view. Scattered light has a significant effect on visibility. Another cause of visibility impairment is absorption. Through this process, image forming light is absorbed by particles and gases. It is taken out of the sight path before ever reaching the viewer's eyes. Although significant, absorption processes contribute less to visibility impairment than do scattering processes. The sum of scattering and absorption is light extinction. Extinction, or loss of light, is directly related to the concentration of particles in the atmosphere. Five types of pollutants play an important role in the formation of haze. They are sulfates, nitrates, organics, elemental carbon, and dust. Emissions of sulfur dioxide react in the atmosphere to form sulfates. Most sulfur dioxide is emitted from fossil fuel-fired power plants and other activities like smelting, industrial boilers, and oil refineries, which involve the combustion of sulfur-bearing fuels. Sulfates are the dominant cause of visibility impairment in the eastern United States. One reason sulfates are a large contributor to haze is that they absorb water in humid conditions and grow to a size that is very efficient at scattering light. This is a typical summer day in Shenandoah National Park when the relative humidity is 40 percent. This is the same day with the same levels of pollution, but the relative humidity has increased to 90 percent. Visibility impairment due to sulfates is greatly magnified under high humidity conditions. Emissions of nitrogen oxides react in the atmosphere to form nitrate particles. Nitrogen oxides are emitted during fuel combustion. Automobiles, power plants, and other industrial processes emit significant amounts of nitrogen oxides. Nitrates, like sulfates, also scatter more light under high humidity conditions. When gaseous hydrocarbon emissions react in the atmosphere, they form organic carbon particles. Sources of hydrocarbons include automobile exhaust, industrial sources, solvent evaporations from paint, and other consumer products. There are even natural hydrocarbon emissions from trees. Organic carbon particles can also be directly emitted by fire. Elemental carbon is basically soot. It is directly emitted from fire activities, from diesel engines, and other combustion processes. Dust is emitted into the air from a number of activities. These include vehicles on dirt roads, construction activities, and windblown dust. We use several terms to describe visibility conditions. Visual range is the term most often used to describe visibility. It is defined as the greatest distance a large black object can be seen and recognized against the background sky. 
visual range gives an estimate of viewing distance. When you hear an airline pilot talking about miles of visibility, he or she is talking about the visual range. There is more to visibility than how far we can see. Visibility is also how well we can see. Clarity, color, texture, and contrast are all important elements of a scene. Changes in visual range are often not directly proportional to how we perceive changes in visibility. Consider these simulations of Shenandoah National Park. This is a clear day. The visibility is about 90 miles. This is the same view after adding sulfates to the atmosphere. The visibility has dropped from 90 to 18 miles. Let's look at a hazy day in the park. The visibility is 8 miles. We can add the same concentration of sulfates to this scene and the visibility drops from 8 to 6 miles. It is much harder to see a perceptible change in this scene. Adding air pollution to a clean atmosphere creates a more noticeable problem than adding the same amount to a dirty atmosphere. Another index that we use to describe visibility involves an index of haziness called the deciview. The deciview describes visibility similarly to the way the decibel scale describes sound. Deciview values range from zero, which describes pristine visibility conditions, to more than 40 deciviews, which represents very polluted conditions. Polluted air is associated with a higher deciview and a lower visual range. That is, fewer miles of visibility. To help illustrate how the deciview compares to miles of visibility, throughout this video we will report visibility using both indexes. Since the 1940s, human observations of visual range have been routinely made and recorded at airports. In the 1980s, the EPA, federal land managers, and state air agencies began a national monitoring program called IMPROVE, the Interagency Monitoring of Protected Visual Environments. IMPROVE began with a network of 30 monitoring sites in national parks and wilderness areas. Today, the IMPROVE network includes over 100 sites in remote locations throughout the United States. The IMPROVE system uses several types of monitoring devices to measure visibility. By considering all of the monitored data together, we get a more complete picture of trends and variations in visibility. Monitoring methods can be categorized into three classes, aerosol, optical, and view monitoring. Improve aerosol samplers measure the concentrations of sulfates, nitrates, organics, elemental carbon, and dust, the pollutants that have the biggest effect on visibility. Measurements of these pollutants are made in conjunction with optical measurements to identify the sources contributing to the visibility problem. The Improve Aerosol Sampler collects particle samples. From these samples, we obtain a profile of the type and concentration of these pollutants. We can then estimate light extinction using these measurements. Improve uses two kinds of instruments to measure optical properties of the atmosphere. Transmissometers measure the light lost due to scattering and absorption in the atmosphere. Nephilometers measure only atmospheric scattering. Transmissometers measure the amount of light lost over a distance between a transmitter and a receiver. A transmitter component housing a light source and a receiver component with a light detector are generally separated by a distance of 1 to 10 miles. The amount of light lost over that distance is recorded as an estimate of light extinction. Nephilometers measure scattering in the atmosphere. Scattering, plus a measurement of absorption, can be used to estimate light extinction. View monitoring, using cameras, can be used to record the changing appearance of a scene as visibility levels vary. A photograph is the most simple and direct way of communicating visibility impairment, as the photographs from this improved site at Canyonlands National Park in Utah will show. A systematic photography program records the appearance of a scene under a variety of haze levels, different lighting conditions, different vegetative cover, and different cloud effects. Time-lapse video cameras are sometimes used to record real-time changes in a scene.
One striking result from analysis of the monitoring data is of the large differences in visibility between the eastern and western United States. The rural mountain areas of the west, including the Great Basin area, Central Rocky Mountains, and non-urban southwest, record some of the best visibility in the United States. Visual range often exceeds 100 miles, or about 9 deciviews. In contrast, east of the Mississippi River and south of the Great Lakes, visual range averages about 22 miles, or 24 deciviews. You might wonder how these visibility conditions would compare with the natural background visibility if there were no human-caused air pollutants. Natural background visual range at Shenandoah National Park is about 90 miles, or 10 deciviews. Compare this with the current annual average visual range of 22 miles, or 24 deciviews. The visual range is reduced by 75 percent from natural background conditions. At Grand Canyon National Park, the difference is less dramatic, but still very noticeable. The natural background visual range can be 150 miles, or 5 deciviews. The current annual average visual range is 100 miles, or 9 deciviews, a reduction of 33 percent. There are differences in visibility between seasons. Generally speaking, visibility is worse in summer and best during the winter months. Seasonal averages for the Central Rockies, Colorado Plateau, and Great Basin area are shown in blue. Averages for the east and east-central United States are shown in yellow. It is not surprising that concentrations of pollutants are also higher in summer and lower in winter, and that sulfate concentrations follow the same seasonal trend. Remember that sulfates are one of the largest contributors to visibility impairment. Airport observations have been used to examine historical trends in visibility across the United States. These maps show the amount of haze during the summer months of 1970, 1980, and 1990. Blue indicates less haze and better visibility, while red represents more haze and worse visibility. Notice the marked increase in summertime haze over the eastern U.S. between 1970 and 1980. Since the early 1980s, we have begun to see some improvement. This follows the trend in sulfur emissions during these periods. Once we understand how much of each type of pollutant is present in a park or wilderness area, the next step is to identify what is causing the problem. In order to fully formulate possible solutions, we must quantify how much of the problem is coming from each emission source or source type and to quantify the effect of emission reduction measures. The sources of air pollutants are identified from databases referred to as emissions inventories. Emissions inventories are developed by state and local air quality agencies and are used to calculate the rates of emissions from all large and small sources that emit pollutants into the atmosphere. These inventories include estimates of emissions from large individual sources, like coal-burning power plants, copper smelters, and large manufacturing plants. Inventories also quantify emissions from smaller sources that added together contribute significantly to pollutant levels. These area sources include automobiles, home wood stoves, and gasoline stations. Estimates of emissions from a variety of other sources are also considered. These include emissions from wildfires and planned burning, as well as natural emissions like hydrocarbons from trees, windblown dust, volcanoes, and geothermal activity. We continue to develop computer-assisted techniques to characterize how much of a pollutant in a given location is due to a particular source or source type. Atmospheric scientists generally refer to these techniques as models because a computer program is intended to create a conceptual model of the atmosphere for predicting the behavior of pollutants. These models require information on source location, pollutant emissions, and weather patterns. Models must be capable of characterizing sources over a large geographic area, and they must consider the chemical reactions that take place in the atmosphere. One such model was used to study the buildup and conversion of sulfur dioxide emissions in the eastern United States. Computer graphics give three-dimensional form to the pollutant concentrations. Sulfur dioxide from coal-fired power plants and factories is shown as red clouds, while blue clouds represent sulfate byproduct. 
Here, sulfur dioxide accumulates above the Midwest. Patches of sulfur dioxide transform into sulfates that are carried into the upper atmosphere and blown into New England and Canada. Sections 169A and 169B of the Clean Air Act require a program for visibility protection, including the mitigation of regional haze for 156 national parks and wilderness areas that are referred to as Class I areas. Under this visibility protection program, the Clean Air Act establishes specific roles for EPA, federal land managers, and state, local, and tribal air quality agencies. The direct responsibility for evaluating and regulating air pollution sources rests with EPA and the states. The federal land managers have an important role in air quality monitoring, research, and the development of models for predicting new source impacts. EPA and state activities should be coordinated with federal land managers who have an important voice in the development of national visibility protection policies. Under the Clean Air Act, many pollution problems are addressed by state and local air quality agencies through what are called state implementation plans. Tribal governments may develop similar plans, called tribal implementation plans, to address air quality problems on tribal lands. Implementation plans are a set of regulations designed to meet general criteria that are set by EPA. The Clean Air Act authorizes EPA to answer the question, what is a problem, and gives states and tribes the flexibility to solve the problem with regulations as they see fit. Once implementation plans are developed at the state and tribal levels, they are submitted to EPA for review and approval. Once approved, the provisions of the implementation plans are enforceable by states, EPA, tribes, and by citizens. The implementation plan development process includes opportunity for review by the general public. Section 169A of the Clean Air Act establishes as a goal the prevention of any future and the remedying of any existing visibility impairment in mandatory Class I federal areas, which impairment results from man-made air pollution. In simpler language, this means that Congress has established a goal of achieving natural visibility conditions. Remember that current visibility in the east has been reduced by 70 miles or is 14 decibels hazier than natural conditions. In the west, current visibility is reduced by 50 miles or is 4 decibels hazier than natural conditions. The Clean Air Act authorizes EPA to require states to develop implementation plans for visibility protection. The state implementation plans are required to achieve reasonable progress toward natural background conditions in light of a number of considerations listed in the Act. On April 22, 1999, Administrator Carol Browner signed an EPA regulation that requires state implementation plans for regional haze. This regulation will require states to determine how much their emissions contribute to pollution in national parks and wilderness areas to set long-term reasonable progress goals expressed in DeciViews, and to develop long-term strategies for meeting the goals. Between now and the year 2008, states will be working with EPA and federal land managers to better understand the causes of regional haze. These agencies will work together to develop an expanded monitoring network to identify the causes of visibility impairment. They will also refine emissions inventories and use air quality models to predict the effect of future strategies to reduce emissions. EPA is encouraging the development of multi-state regional planning organizations to foster interagency communication and efficiency. EPA established the Grand Canyon Visibility Transport Commission in response to 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act. The Commission completed its work in 1996 and made recommendations to improve visibility in the Grand Canyon and 15 other national parks and wilderness areas on the Colorado Plateau. The recommendations promote multi-state organizations and programs that will further reduce pollution and its resultant haze. The Western Regional Air Partnership, RAP, is continuing efforts begun by the Grand Canyon Visibility Transport Commission. This organization is a collaboration of Western states, Western tribal nations, 
federal agencies, and other organizations interested in finding workable solutions to visibility problems in the western states. Four other regional planning organizations are also working on the regional haze problem. These organizations include the Central States Regional Air Partnership, the Midwest Regional Planning Organization, affiliated with the Lake Michigan Air Directors Consortium, in the Northeast, the Ozone Transport Commission, and the Southeastern States Air Resource Managers. Over the coming years, these groups of states and tribal governments will collaborate to better understand the interstate transport of haze-causing pollution. They will also evaluate potential emission reduction strategies that can be put in place by individual state governments. It is also important to note that many of the Federal Clean Air Act programs and requirements will reduce pollutants that contribute to regional haze. For example, the acid rain program introduced under the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 will reduce emissions in eastern states by 10 million tons per year between 1990 and 2010. That level of reduction should improve visibility in much of the east. The types of airborne particles that cause regional haze have also been linked to serious health and environmental effects. Actions that reduce levels of visibility impairing pollutants will benefit public health. Haze causing particles fall into a size we refer to as the fine particle fraction. They are smaller than two and a half micrometers in diameter, less than one tenth the diameter of the average human hair. A scientific review by the Environmental Protection Agency concluded that fine particles penetrate deeply into the lungs, contributing to health effects, such as premature death and increased hospital admissions and emergency room visits, especially among the elderly and individuals with cardiopulmonary disease, decreased lung function and increased respiratory symptoms and disease in children and individuals with cardiopulmonary diseases like asthma, and alterations in lung tissue and structure and in respiratory tract defense mechanisms. Everyone in the country can play an important role in achieving clean air. Government, industry, and private citizens are working to reduce or prevent air pollution. If we all do our share, the benefits will be tremendous. There are two important ways concerned citizens can act to promote clean air. First, pay attention to the regulation development process and let regulators know where you stand. Know your regulatory agencies. EPA, state, and local air quality agencies will listen to what you have to say. There are no easy answers. Often decisions come down to public judgments, whether the benefits of a particular action outweigh the costs of that action. One of the driving forces behind reducing air pollution is citizen concern and involvement. Second, there are many ways you can help to reduce air pollution and regional haze. If you conserve energy, you can help to reduce power plant emissions. You can conserve energy by using energy efficient lighting, turning off lights and appliances when not in use, asking your local utility about customer energy conservation programs. If they have one, sign up. If they don't, encourage them to start one. Purchase energy efficient appliances when you replace them. If you reduce automobile emissions, you will reduce emissions not only in your town, but you help to reduce aerosols in national parks and wilderness areas. You can reduce automobile emissions by reducing trips and ride sharing, avoiding peak traffic periods, using public and alternative transportation, getting regular tune-ups and maintenance checks, and purchasing fuel-efficient cars. When buying a car, check its posted fuel efficiency and seek the most fuel efficient car that meets your needs. There are also ways you may reduce emissions from your wood stove or fireplace. Use dry, well seasoned wood and build efficient fires that burn hot and clean. Check your stack, clean your chimney and inspect your wood stove's catalyst annually. A well maintained and operated stove produces less pollution and is better for the environment. Adhere to local or state regulations about when and where wood stove use is permitted. 
Many local news stations report red pollution days when restrictions are in effect. Information on many visibility topics is available from several EPA websites. For general information, brochures on visibility, and information on the Regional Hayes Rule, see the Office of Air and Radiation website. For annual national air quality and emissions trends, go to the Offices of Air Quality Planning and Standards website. And for information on how to identify and contact your state, local, or tribal air quality agency, contact this EPA website. The National Park Service maintains a website for information on air quality in national parks. See the United States Forest Service website for further information on their air quality programs and efforts. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service maintains a website for further information on their air quality programs and efforts. To access improved data and view related reports, see the improved website at CIRA, Colorado State University. The regional planning organizations mentioned in the video also maintain websites. <laughs>